feel miserable because they value truth and it feels dishonest. Oh, good. I'm so happy you asked that. That's very important. This is the objection I often hear. It's not authentic. I'm not being authentic. To which the answer is, so what? <laughs> I don't want your authenticity. I want your good behavior. When I sit next to you on an airplane, I don't care if you're authentically moody. I would much prefer you're non-authentically non-moody. How's this? Body odor is authentic. <laughs> it is. Bad breath is authentic. Why do you brush your teeth so often? Why do you shower every day? It's inauthentic to use deodorant. I, I compare bad moods to bad breath. You brush your bad breath away, you brush your bad mood away. How can a happy person living with a moody person maintain his or her happiness? You don't ask easy questions, I'll tell you that. This is, uh, I have no humor on the answer to this. This is very, very problematic. The, the unhappy person is being unfair to you. That's why, by the way, I want to tell you something, which uh, again, I, uh, uh, I, if uh, not hiding what you believe uh, helps you live longer, I'm going to live a long time. <laughs> I do say what I believe. I mean, there are filters between my, my mind and my mouth, but I do say what I believe. So, uh, in, in this regard, I knew, I knew it's interesting, I remember, because I was always a thinker, and I don't take credit for it. People are born in certain ways. You have kids, you know, some are born a certain I was born a thinker. And I thought about all these issues already in high school. And I remember, in high school, coming to the conclusion that I would never necessarily judge a person who had an extramarital affair, even though, of course, adultery is wrong. It's a given. But I could judge the act, but I wasn't even in high school prepared to always judge because I knew I didn't know anything going on in the marriage. So let's say you here, you know a couple's married 30 years. One of the spouses has been moody for 30 years. The other one has tried everything to bring joy into the other one's life. Finally, after 30 years, has an affair. Is the affair wrong? It's wrong. Do I completely blame the person? No, I don't. Because we don't know what the 30 years was like. That is how severely I judge the moody. I'm sorry, I do. You, you, when you get married, you owe certain things. Isn't that Jewish? There's a ketubah, there's a list of debts, things you owe your spouse. You owe your spouse a cheerful countenance. Does that mean you can never say you're unhappy? Say you're unhappy all you want. You don't have to act it. If you feel unhappy, over, of course this is your best friend, hopefully, your spouse. Of course you should say, you know what's bothering me? I want to know, honey, what is bothering you? Of course, that's totally right. Uh, to the, because the other extreme is also terrible, where they just close down. I don't want to tell you, what, what's troubling you? Nothing. What are you thinking about? Nothing. That's also terrible. Both extremes are terrible. terrible. Of course you should say what's bothering you. But you have to act it, and certainly not take it out on the closest person in life to you. So, I don't, I don't know what to tell you to do, but I can only tell you, uh, well, I've already said my piece, uh, it's inexcusable. It is, it's just inexcusable. We have, de we have obligations, behavioral obligations, to the person we marry. And by the way, it's interesting. I'll tell you something. This is more than you bargained for, all this openness. So I'll tell you something you'll really... I, I was divorced, and when I got divorced, went to the bed then here in Los Angeles. This is going to blow your mind. Went to the bed then in Los Angeles. 
so many years ago, must be, I don't know, well, he's here, 30 years ago, about 28 years ago. Went to the bed then, and uh, the day to, of getting the get. And um, the rabbi, my suit to, uh, momentarily to be ex-wife, uh, was not was not there yet, and so we started talking, and he goes, Oh, Mr. Prager, I just want you to know I love your radio show. It was the last thing I expected. It's another East European bearded rabbi, the head of the bed that listens to my radio show. It cracked me up. Anyway, so we start talking. It was like a, an opening for me to start talking. So I said, Rabbi, it must be pretty hard to be the head of the bed then in California, America, at this time in history with all this divorce. And he looked at me and he said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Prager. There were a lot of couples in the old country who should have gotten divorced. Oh, uh, I had no, I had nothing to say. It was an unbelievable statement. I was certain he would say, oh, you're right. The times we live in, people divorce so easily. And instead he said, there wasn't enough divorce. Do you know that there is a rabbi who wrote a book, Divorces and Mitzvah? Because Rashi says it's a mitzvah. Do you know how the Talmud discusses it? Jewish life did, Jewish life did not follow Judaism in, in its almost banning divorce. Jews became much more severe than Judaism. Judaism does not believe that on this earth you should have hell and a terrible marriage is hellish. And I'm proud of Judaism for that belief. I'm not proud of Jews for undermining Judaism's Rachmanus on couples who have it bad. So it's uh, something to be aware of. How can we instill the value of happiness in our children in today's feelings-based society? You're good. You're good. By saying, so what? That's all you have to do. You don't feel like it, or you feel like it, so what? That's the end. How you feel, my darling, beloved, brilliant child who is going to go to Harvard, let me tell you something. The only people in the world who care how you feel are your mommy, your daddy, your therapist, and you. Nobody else. All seven billion people only care how you act. Have a great day. Okay, good. Next. Would you stay in an unhappy marriage for the happiness of the children? That's, that's the $64,000 question. Having been through this, I have some degree of expertise, and having talked about this with people on the radio who, because they're anonymous, open up, people cry on my radio show. I'm, it's really something, I have really lived a lifetime of being educated by people. I have raised this question in every fashion possible. I have asked children of divorced parents, call in, you're an adult now. Do you think your parents should have stayed together for your sake? In, I would say, at least 85% of the cases, they said no. If you ask them when they're 10, they say yes. If you ask them when they're 30, they don't say yes. So here is the single greatest lesson I have learned in my life and in the lives of thousands of others that I have learned from. What most hurts children is what happens after the divorce, not the divorce. If parents can be civil, if parents can stay intimately involved in their children's lives, if neither parent badmouths the other parent, 
if no matter how angry one spouse is at the other, they realize that it is still that children's mother or that children's father, then it can work out. That's the answer. Because I'll tell you another thing. It's not so easy if you divorce when they get to college. Parents say, oh, we'll stay together till they're in college and then they left the house and we'll divorce. You're 21 years old, you go off to college and the parents are divorce. I don't know if that's easier than if they'd have done it when you were 15, let alone if three, I mean three is the ideal. Of course, because the child doesn't know if the parents don't make a terrible scene out of it. They only know they have two homes now. But this notion, I'll stay together till they're in college. I've asked kids in college, and they said it, 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 it tore them up as much as they'd have been at 15. It's a tearing moment. It is. There are other kids, by the way, who are not torn up. There are a lot of people who call and say, thank God they divorced. I begged my mother to divorce. I begged my father to divorce. Why is it healthy to see uh, one parent ridicule the other? And by the way, this is a very important little lesson that I learned also. Because a lot of people who are unhappily married, and by the way, it's almost only the unhappily married, among those most antagonistic to divorce are the unhappily married. The happily married are much less antagonistic to divorce. The unhappily married are antagonistic because, hey, I'm suffering, why shouldn't you? And I understand that. I've sacrificed. Who were you to get out of this? But I, I, I have learned o over the course of years that uh, people think that people divorce like that. This is a common thing. Oh, people divorce. They look at Hollywood where there's interchangeable couples and they think that's the norm. So listen to what happened. This was an amazing evening. I hope there's a recording of it somewhere. I had the rabbi, priest, and minister on the show. Subject, divorce. And they all say people divorce too easily today. So I decided to challenge them. So I began with uh, the, uh, the minister. I said, Pastor, you said that, uh, said that people divorce too easily. Uh, do you know anyone really well who has divorced? He said, well, yes, my brother. Okay, Pastor, do you feel that your brother divorced too easily? No, 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 no. My brother and his wife, I know for a fact, for years went to marital therapy. They worked and worked, and it just didn't work. Father, you said that people divorce too easily. Do you know anybody really well who divorced? I said, yes, my mother. I said, do you feel she divorced too easily? Well, Dennis, to tell you the truth, I think it saved her life. Thank you, Father. Rabbi, you said people divorce too easily. Do you know anyone well who divorced? I said, yes, my parents. Did they divorce too easily? No, they had a horrific marriage, and thank God they divorced. I'm okay. And that's what I have always seen. People say people divorce at the drop of a hat. Then you ask them, do you know anybody who divorced at the drop of a hat? No. Everybody they know who divorced went through hell before they divorced. Something worth remembering. Most unhappy people know, I know don't know they're unhappy. <laughs> so how can they correct a problem they don't even know they have? This is a good question. <laughs> you are of Tsuru. If you are married to somebody who is unhappy and doesn't know that they are unhappy, <laughs> this is a serious problem. 
I have to think about that. No, I'm serious. It's a new question. Don't get those often after 2,000 lectures. That's an interesting question. I think that's pretty rare. So you, you, so the, the person who wrote this is obviously implying that they know somebody who is unhappy and thinks they're happy. I haven't met that, I have to say. I'm not doubting you, I just, raise your hand if you know someone who's unhappy and they don't think they're unhappy. Did you write the question? Oh, okay. <laughs> One hand, and it's the questioner. Two heads, two heads, okay. So how many people are here? 400, whatever it's about? <laughs> two out of, that's what, it's, this is extremely rare. Uh, the, um, so I don't have an answer. It almost doesn't matter because I'm behavior oriented. So my only question that you can answer, please, do they act unhappy or you believe they are unhappy? Okay, so if they act unhappy, the, the issue remains overwhelmingly how they act. So they feel unhappy and act unhappy, but think they're happy? Mm. Okay, well, I did read, and I'm serious, the Daily Mail in England just reported of a woman who thought she is a cat. And uh, they should meet. She's a happy cat, so they, 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 they have a chance. All right, uh, so I have one more and I'll take this and then, uh, then I'll let you go. Do you think wealth slash material success are correlated? I think you mean happiness and material success, right? Whoever wrote this. Wealth and material success are synonymous. Uh, here is the story on wealth, on money and happiness. Here is the story, very, it's very important. Uh, and, and that is that uh, extreme poverty is an obstacle to happiness. Extreme wealth is also an obstacle to happiness. That is why all the studies of lottery winners show that people's happiness overwhelmingly declined within a year of the uh, winning of vast sums of money. I, I never envy the people who win that. Here's another reason, by the way, uh, that uh, actual uh, wealth can be an obstacle to happiness. Uh, there, aside from the obvious ones, but here, here's a, a reason. A lot of people who aren't wealthy think that if they were wealthy, they'd be happy. So what happens? Some of these people do become wealthy. And then lo and behold, they're not any happier then they are really in trouble. Because if you think X will make you happy, and then you get X and you're not happy, you're in bad straits because you have no idea how to be happy. The, the one solution didn't work. So here is what I believe. I believe that money makes the happy happier and the unhappy unhappier. That is my bottom line. That, so it is not money. It is your pre-existing condition that matters. If you are a happy individual and you come into money, wonderful. Now I'm even more secure financially. Now I could be even more charitable. Now I could buy a jet and that's great. I don't have to wait in lines at airports. But that's not what makes me happy. But the unhappy will be unhappier because now they will be unhappy and have the thing they thought would make them happy and it's not working. So it is largely independent of money. Largely. And it's, it's sad. I'll end with this because I have a lot to say obviously. I, look, I've been broadcasting the happiness hour for 16 years and I've come up with different subjects much of the time. So it's hundreds and hundreds of subjects. There's so much to say about it, and I do have a book on happiness, and you can get it used for, I think, $2.99. You can get it new for $11.99, and if you have any conscience, you will buy it new. I'm just kidding. I don't buy it used, it's fine. But uh, there, there are so many things to be said 
about, <coughs> about happiness that I, I just haven't been able to speak about uh, tonight. The moral obligation is the one that I have tried uh, to emphasize. The behavior is everything. But there is so much wisdom to be had, and let me end with this point. It's something people don't think about, but when you do, you'll realize how, how true it is. If people only ask before they did anything, will doing this make me happier, they would lead a completely different life. How's this? Before you watch three hours of TV, ask yourself, will I be happier after I watch three hours of TV? So it's an interesting question to ask. It's, it's, so that's why I have a chapter on the difference between fun and happiness. Fun is what you experience during an act. Happiness is what you experience after. If college kids, especially girls, ask themselves before a one-night hookup, will I be happier after the hookup tomorrow morning? Most of them, not all, most wouldn't do it. Oddly enough, asking what brings happiness will even make you a better person. That's why I believe goodness and happiness are related. Because if you just ask what will make me happy, not what will be fun, what will make me happy, you will be different. You ever uh, hear the ad for Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone ad, which is a, a language, self-teaching language videos has a very interesting ad. So, if you got a new pair of shoes, something goes something like this, you're gonna be a better person. If you, uh, I forgot the other thing, you're gonna be happier? What if you learned the language? And that's right. If I said to you, if you gave up an hour of TV a day and studied Portuguese, one year from now you would know Portuguese or study the clarinet. One year from now, you will be playing songs on the clarinet and you will have missed an hour of TV each night. Will you be happier if you miss the hour of TV and play the clarinet? It's a rhetorical question. Everyone in this room knows the answer is yes. But people don't do what will make them happy. I work out three times a week. May I say, I hate it. When they wish me a good workout as I enter the club, I go, what, are you kidding? This is like the worst hour of the week for me. But here's the point. I'm always literally happier after it's over. Because I ask what's going to make me happy, not what feels good. Just ask that. Just ask that before anything. And life will be different. It's a great subject, and the beauty is I got it all from Judaism. Thank you so much.